This is Angaur and the Palau Islands in the Pacific. Here, on the march to the Philippines, United States troops land. In grim, close fighting, they move up to seize vital airstrips and outflank the last Japanese island garrisons guarding the Philippines' approaches. The Palau Islands, strategically located, are the scene of one more long leap forward by the Allies in the Pacific. To this objective come the raw materials of battle, men and supplies in overwhelming quantity to drive out the enemy. Pontoons are cut loose and launched into the surf to provide unloading piers. Hopper scout plane takes off on a reconnaissance mission. Tanks and men move into Bloody Gulch, a narrow ravine where the enemy is heavily entrenched. A tank hits a Japanese mine. Under fire, medical troops go in to save wounded comrades. The battle for Bloody Gulch continues. Infantrymen move out around the enemy to attack from the rear. Back from battle, objective one, and the war in the Pacific continues toward a successful end. At the Turkish Embassy in Washington, funeral services for Mehmet Munir Ertegun, Turkey's ambassador to the United States. Paying last respects is Chinese ambassador Dr. Wei Tao Ming, among scores of international dignitaries. Vladimir Urban, Czechoslovakian ambassador, Russian ambassador Gromyko, and United States Chief Justice Stone. With full military honors, Ambassador Ertegun's body is borne from the embassy through the streets of Washington. As dean of the diplomatic corps, Mr. Ertegun had set a pattern for the whole company of foreign representatives, meeting the demands of a period of world conflict with courage, skill, and efficiency. Arlington Cemetery, last resting place of American heroes, an army caisson bears the coffin. After temporary internment here, the ambassador's body will return to his native homeland. Mehmet Munir Ertegun had represented Turkey in Britain, Switzerland, France, and the United States. His passing deprives the international scene of a valued counselor. In Madison Square Garden, New York, before 20,000 spectators, Under Secretary of State Edward Stettinius is greeted by former ambassador to Russia, Joseph Davies at a rally of the National Council of American-Soviet Friendship. Russia's ambassador, Andrei Gromyko, is welcome to this impressive celebration. 
of the 11th anniversary of the reestablishment of diplomatic relations between the United States and the Soviet Union. Ambassador Gromyko, British Ambassador Halifax, Under Secretary Statinius and Ambassador Davies, Ambassador Gromyko emphasizes Soviet United States cooperation. It gives me great pleasure to be present for the second time at the great meeting in Madison Square Garden, dedicated to the date of the re-establishment of diplomatic relations between the United States and the Soviet Union. Our countries are marking the 11th anniversary of the re-establishment of these relations. It is sufficient to give a quick glance at the period since 1933 to convince oneself that the resumption of normal relations between the two countries is really a factor of great potential and historic importance. It is also, it is also unnecessary to speak ex extensively of the tremendous importance which successful cooperation between two such great countries of the world as the United States and the Soviet Union has and will have in the future. Under Secretary Statinius speaks of the common goal. It is a great honor for me to have this opportunity afforded by the National Council of American-Soviet Friendship to speak this evening of the close relationship existing between the United States and the Union of the Soviet Socialist Republics. The friendship between our two countries is a cherished heritage of our people. Our relations have grown close in the ordeal of this worldwide war in which we have joined our efforts in a joint cause. We are winning this war. And our victory will be complete. It will be a, com a common victory wrought by a common effort, one for the common good of the peace-loving peoples of the world. Aachen, first German city to be captured by the Allies. Now, after long, bloody street-by-street -street fighting, this German textile and coal center, with a pre-war population of 165,000, is in allied hands, and the stars and stripes go up. The last members of the German garrison surrender. Their commander had refused to declare Aachen on the path into the Rhine Valley, an open city. Of the 3,000 Nazi troops who defended it, only 800 remain. Nazi troops surrender on the soil of their homeland. They march from Aachen, the first German city to be conquered since the Napoleonic Wars. 